Good morning, Senate members. Good morning. The time for convening having arrived, the Senate will come to order. The Senate will come to order. All senators, please come in and take your seats. All senators, please come to the chamber and take your seats. All senators, please come in and take your seats. We need to get started. The time for convening having arrived, the Senate will come to order. At this time, I will ask all unauthorized persons to exit the chamber, please. All unauthorized persons exit the chamber, please. All senators, please take your seats and cease audible conversation. Doorkeepers, secure the doors. We are preparing to receive the President of the Senate. At this time, I will appoint a committee of escort to escort our President of the Senate to the rostrum. I would ask the following senators to convene at the main entrance of the Senate at this time. The Senator from the 15th, the Distinguished Dean of the Senate. The Senator from the 51st, our Distinguished Majority Leader. The Senator from the 55th, our Distinguished Minority Leader. The Senator from the 29th, our Distinguished Majority Whip. And the Senator from the 22nd, our Distinguished Minority Whip. Mr. Sergeant at Arms. Mr. President, the Honorable Burt Jones, newly elected Lieutenant Governor and President of the Senate, awaits entrance to this chamber. Mr. Sergeant at Arms, please allow the distinguished President of the Senate to enter this chamber. The Committee of Escort will escort the President of the Senate to this rostrum. I would now like to recognize some very special guests that we have with us today. Would you please stand and be recognized when I call your name? I'm certain the very proud father of our President of the Senate, Mr. Bill Jones. And on the rostrum behind me, uh, our President and his lovely wife's two beautiful children, Stella and Banks, thank you so much for being with us today. And let's take a minute and give a very special Senate welcome and a thank you in advance for the service that she will do and recognize the First Lady of the Senate, Jan Jones. Right. 
You know, President Jones has been a friend to me personally. He's been a friend to this chamber, and he's been a friend to Georgians for a long time, most specifically with his last 10 years of distinguished service in this Senate chamber. President Jones comes from a family of service. His father, who is thankfully with us this morning, served across the way in the House for several years and served with distinction. And that attitude of service continues in the generations of the Jones family. It's a family, as I said in my remarks to you on Monday, it's a family mission of service with the Joneses. And we're, we're the beneficiaries of that along with the state of Georgia. And the family that's behind me, this beautiful family, is going to be a part of that mission and a part of that service that we will primarily benefit from. But again, more broadly, so will the people of the state of Georgia. So for our Lieutenant Governor and our new president, we have a gift. We have a gavel that is a new gavel for him. It is a new gavel and a new block. And it's a new gavel that's going to make banging for the passage of new bills. And it's going to recognize bringing us to order. And at times, we will be grateful that it will also recognize the adjourning of this chamber at times when we need it. So with that, I want to tell you about this handcrafted gavel and block. It's made of maple with a cherry stain. The gavel is hand-spun black walnut. It's crafted by Robert Stebbins and John Rudert of Woodcrafters of Roswell. And it is my high honor and privilege to now pass to our president and our new lieutenant governor with the great support of his family that's behind me, this gavel, as I pass to him for this chamber. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you, Pro Tem uh, Kennedy. I greatly appreciate those kind words. And, and uh, thank you, Senate colleagues or and body here. It, uh, I believe I, I can remember a few months ago that I was standing right here in the well uh, giving my farewell speech as a senator. But I ended it with saying, I'll be back. Don't worry. <laughs> And uh, Dean, you remember that, don't you? Yeah. And uh, anyways, but it, it's a it's a pleasure to have served in the in the Senate uh, chambers uh, as a as a senator, and I'm I'm honored to be uh, now presiding over the this distinguished body, and and um, I hope uh, I hope uh, y'all enjoy uh, being in the your roles as senators as much as I did, uh, and I can assure you, you always have a an open door uh, with my office, and, and I will uh, always be mindful of uh, your opinions. I all, we always say here in this Senate, every senator has a voice, and, uh, and I believe that uh, no matter in the minority party or the majority party, and we will always have an open door policy here uh, well, as long as I'm lieutenant governor, I can assure you that. Uh, you know, I, uh, it, it is kind of odd timing here uh, for me to be presiding, first getting to preside on the third day, uh, you know, and, but, it, you know, we got, you know what is king in this state, and that's college football, you know. And I tell, uh, I told somebody the other day, I told my good friend from the 19th, I said, you know, when I was at the University of Georgia playing, I got to watch a lot of games from the sideline, you know. Never did I know the Georgia football would put me on the sideline for the lieutenant governor spot, too. So, uh, that was what the delay was for, but uh, uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm honored to uh, hold, have this position. And uh, this, you, you, as everyone in this body knows, that uh, you know it takes a village, and you can't do this alone. And that's why I want to recognize my wife and my two children right here again, uh, and please give them a round of applause right there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, everybody, everybody knows uh, that has been in public service. Uh, I always tell people that, uh, look, without public service, I'd be a lot better husband, father, and business person. And, uh, and that's true with all of us in this room. And, and I can tell you that uh, uh, you can't do this uh, without a good support uh, group at home and, and, uh, and Jan. Uh, has uh, always been very supportive and and the kids uh, even though 
even though, you know, the, the, they, don't, they don't, and I don't blame them either, don't like going to a lot of the functions and everything. They, they, do, they do it for daddy, you know. If everything was a Luke Bryan concert, we'd probably be all right, you know. Uh, unfortunately, it is not. And uh, so, uh, but I, I can't say enough about them. My father, uh, he was here today as well. The, uh, I had my, my other family, we had some storms last night, I'm, I'm sure most of y'all know of, and and uh, uh, so my, my siblings were not able to be here because we had some damage uh, to, to some uh, uh, commercial properties there and, and they were having to see about things uh, on the home front. Um, and, but my father was able to make it today and, and uh, his, he's, uh, he's somebody who's been a, uh, he served in the house for eight years. Uh, so he knows how this legislative process works. Uh, he served under the Tom Murphy regime over there, and uh, and he saw firsthand how, what an iron fist looks like, you know. So, <laughs> but uh, he enjoyed his time there, and and, uh, and 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 has always obviously been a big role model for me, and 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 been been a great mentor, and and everything uh, you want a parent to be. Uh, my mother was unable to make it. She has she was here for the last two days of the festivities, and. Obviously, I mean, she's she's has Parkinson's disease right now, and so, uh, you know, I was I was amazed she was able to uh, uh, do as much as she did last two days. But uh, obviously, uh, I, if if everybody could have parents like I was fortunate enough to have, uh, I can tell you right now, the world would be a better place because they were they were people. They always taught us hard work, taught us about hard work, but they also taught us about treating people, other people, how you want to be treated, you know, and, uh, and always trying to be mindful of, uh, of people uh, and, and their situations and things of that nature. And I, I just greatly appreciate, appreciate you and, and mom for everything y'all have done for me here. So, So, with that, uh, that being said, I look forward to this session. I think 2023 will be a, a wonderful year, a wonderful session, uh, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, presiding over this body and, and uh, delivering uh, good results for the good people of the state of Georgia, because at the end of the day, that's what we're here for. And, uh, and I always tell people, uh, you know, sometimes we get caught up in party party uh, uh, affiliations or things of that nature. But at the end of the day, each individual senator has to represent their districts and represent it to the best of their ability. And, uh, and sometimes that means going against even what your leadership team might want you to do. And, uh, and so, because uh, uh, what you're here for is to represent the people that put you here and, and what opportunities present itself and how you can be best represent them. And you're looking at somebody live and in color right here who bucked his party plenty of times you know and had an independent streak about him uh but uh uh at at any rate i think it's it's it's, it's in, important to remember that uh that uh you know sometimes you you got to do what's in the best interest of of the folks back home and uh and i know most y'all know that so we're going to get on with our business of today i am very excited um to uh, have uh, the uh, my the pastor of the day here today, um, but before that, we need to I need to recognize the senator from the 29th uh, for the for the reading of the journal. Mr. President, the journals for January 11th and January 12th have been read and found to be correct. Thank you, Senator. I understand our. Rules, our senator from the 28th uh, was not able to be here, who's usually the reader of the journal, and, and I think the, the, uh, the presiding officer has duly noted that. So, as my first day here, my former sweet mate right there, so. Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> it was more important to me than it was to him. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, is there objection to the reading of the journal? Chair hearing none, <clears throat> the reading of the journal is dispensed with. Is there objection to the confirmation of the journal? Hearing none, the journal is adopted. 
All senators who have bills and resolutions to introduce, please bring them to the secretary's desk. First reading of Senate bills and resolutions. Senate Bill 2 by Senators Dolezal of the 27th and others. A bill to be entitled an act to amend an act relating to torts to provide certain immunities from liability claims regarding COVID-19 approved August 5th, 2020. Senate Bill 3 by Senators Albers of the 56th, Kennedy of the 18th, Gooch of the 51st, Anavatarte of the 31st, Walker the 3rd of the 20th and others. A bill to be entitled an act to amend chapter four of title 50 of the official code of Georgia relating to organization of executive branch generally so as to require state departments, agencies, boards, bureaus, offices, commissions, public corporations and authorities. Government to oversight. That concludes the order, Mr. President. That concludes the order. The Senate has received the communication from the Lieutenant, from the Lieutenant Governor uh, requesting that an appointment to the Judiciary Qualifications Commission be confirmed by the Senate. Secretary will read the communication. Mr. President, the Senate has received a communication from Lieutenant Governor Burt Jones requesting that the Senate confirm the following appointment to the Judicial Qualifications Commission, Mr. Warren Selby. This communication has been placed on each senator's desk. That completes the order, Mr. President. The sec secretary has placed the names of the appointee to the Judicial Qualifications Commissions on your desk for your review. Pursuant to the Senate Rules 331, the appointment is referred to the Committee on Assignments. It is now time for the morning roll call. Are there any motions to excuse? Senator from the 31st, for what purpose do you rise? Good morning, Mr. President. It's great to see you this morning. I would ask unanimous consent to excuse the senators from the 25th, 28th, and the 1st. Without objection, the senators from the 28th, 25th, and the 1st are excused. Are there any other motions to excuse? Senator from the 40th, what purpose do you rise? Thank you, Mr. President. I ask for unanimous consent to excuse the senator from the 43rd. Senator from the 43rd, without any objection, is excused. Senator from the 47th, for what purpose do you rise? Good morning, Mr. President. I ask for unanimous consent to excuse the senator from the 46th. Without objection, Senator from 46 is excused. Senator from the 22nd, for what purpose? I ask unanimous consent to excuse the senator from the 34th. Senator, without objection, Senator from the 34th is excused. Is there any other motions? Secretary will call the roll of senators. Please signify your presence by voting yay. Switch. Secretary will unlock the machine. It is now time for the morning uh, devotion. Um, if everyone please take their seats and cease all audible conversation. I would ask the doorkeepers to secure the chambers at this time and ask that uh, you uh, join me in our Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The Georgia flag. I pledge allegiance to the Georgia flag and the principles for which it stands, wisdom, justice, and moderation, courage. 
It is uh, my distinct pleasure I, to those who have uh, been here for a few years and uh, with my colleagues, y'all know that when I have pastor of the day, there's only one pastor I ever bring. Yeah, and, uh, and I don't think uh, in, in 10 years of serving in the Senate, I don't think I ever missed the opportunity to have uh, my, my hometown pastor, Dr. Benny Tate, uh, to, to uh, visit with everyone and, and give the word uh, of the day uh, to, to this body, distinguished body. And once again, I, I thought it was fitting in this new role that uh, Dr. Benny Tate uh, be here and be a part of this because he is not only a dear friend, but he's a wonderful mentor and a, a, a great uh, spiritual leader to not just our family, but uh, thousands of other uh, people across middle Georgia. He has a remarkable story. The, I, he started at Rock Springs Church there in Milner, Georgia, population of 500 now, and uh, back, about 30 plus years ago, 31 years ago now, I believe, uh, and it was a 27 member church. And in, in that three uh, short decades of time, he's built it from 27 members to over 8,000 members, uh, which is phenomenal. And not only are they uh, not only is it a great ministry, but they've built a school, a K through 12 school system. They have countless uh, ministries that have outreach ministries uh, that, that cover uh, 50 plus counties around our state. Uh, it is uh, just remarkable the growth and uh, what good leadership, good spiritual leadership can do uh, for a community. And uh, and and as, after you hear him, you'll you'll. You will, see for, you will see why people, he packs three services a day, uh, every Sunday uh, uh, to hear him, his message because he's, he's dynamic and uh, he's down to earth and, and he just uh, uh, knows how to communicate with people. And, and I'm proud to have him here today as my first day as Lieutenant Governor and presiding over this body. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Benny Tate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bird. And I tell you, after, after that introduction, I'm looking forward to hearing myself. Amen. I, I, I'm going to take Bert with me on the road, introduce me. Uh, what a privilege. What a privilege to be here for this special day. I am so proud of Bert, and uh, I'm so proud of each one of you. I got out of the car out here, and as I was getting out, the chaplain for the uh, the House of Representatives was getting out also, and he said, this is my first time. He said, give me some advice. And I said, well, say to those representatives how much you appreciate them. Let them know that you appreciate the sacrifice that they give for our state, the sacrifice away from their families and all they do. And so more than anything, I just wanted to come today to say thank you to the president but I say thank you to every one of you. Thank you for being willing to serve. I realize it's a sacrifice, and I am very, very grateful. I began to think about what could I share? What could I share with these wonderful men and women? And uh, at our church, I'm preaching a series of messages on pray first. Pray first. And uh, prayer is so important. And I'm convinced it's something that many people don't know a lot about. I heard about two men that were discussing prayer and the importance of it. And uh, one said to the other one, he said, I bet you don't even know the Lord's Prayer. And the man said, I bet you I do. He said, I bet you $10 I know the Lord's Prayer. And the man said, well, I'll take that bet. He said, let's hear it. And the man said, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul will keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul will take. The man pulled out his $10 and he said, I wouldn't have thought you would have known it. Amen. <laughs> so I want to take a few minutes and I want to talk to you about a verse of scripture. <laughs> Some of them just got it. Amen. All right. All right. Uh, it's in John chapter 15, verse 7. This is what God's word says. It says, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, 
You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. I thank you for the privilege of being able to speak here today. The reason why I have this privilege is because of something that actually transpired in the late 1700s. Our forefathers were meeting in Independence Hall. They had been meeting for about five weeks, and they were struggling on agreeing on a constitution. Ladies and gentlemen, they were struggling on states' rights, and they just couldn't agree after about five weeks. And a man by the name of Benjamin Franklin said these words. He said, gentlemen, we need the father of lights to illuminate our minds. If a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without God noticing it, do we think a nation can rise without his aid? And those men dropped on their knees and they prayed and they were able to agree on a constitution. And from there, Ben Franklin made the recommendation that the House and Senate every day would start with devotion and prayer. Perhaps our greatest president was a man by the name of Abraham Lincoln. And he said these words. He said, I've been driven to my knees by an overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. My wisdom and all about me seemed insufficient in the day. The importance of prayer. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done. And you say, Pastor, for my prayer to be answered, what's the three things that have to happen? Number one, you've got to abide. That means you stay close to God no matter what. You've got to abide. See, when you please God, it doesn't matter who you don't please. But if you don't please God, it doesn't matter who you do please. You've got to abide. You've got to stay close. Chester was 80, and his wife Alice, she was about 82. And they were out driving one day, and they saw this young couple. And you couldn't tell if one person was driving the vehicle or two. She was sitting right up under him. And Alice looked over at Chester. And she said, you know, Chester, I remember when it used to be that way with us. And Chester said, yes, Alice, and I haven't moved. Amen. Here's what I want you to know. God hasn't moved. We can be just as close to him as we want to be. So for God to answer our prayers, we got to abide. Then there's a second thing we got to do. Ladies and gentlemen, we got to ask. We got to ask. James 4 and 2 says you have not because you ask not. The Bible says if any man or woman lacks wisdom, let them ask of God. I just want to encourage you to, to abide. I just want to encourage you to ask. Ask God to help you. Ask God to give you wisdom. Ask God to help you in the decision. It may amaze you what he will do. I heard about a little boy that said to his mom and daddy, he said, I, I want a baby brother or sister. And they said, well, Billy, you got to pray. And Billy prayed one month. And Billy prayed two months. And Billy prayed three months. And Billy did what we do sometimes. Billy got discouraged and he quit praying. And six months later, his daddy said, Billy, get in the truck. We're going somewhere. And they went down to the hospital, ladies and gentlemen. And when they got down to the hospital, they went into a room there. And there was mother. And they pulled the curtain back, and she was holding a baby. And they pulled the curtain back a little more, and she was holding another baby. And they pulled the curtain back a little more, and she was holding the third baby. And Daddy looked over at Billy and said, Billy, aren't you glad you prayed? Billy said, yes, Daddy. And aren't you glad I stopped after three months? <laughs> Look here, folks. We got to simply abide. We just got to stay close to him. We've got to ask. And then we know that God will answer. Because he said, if my people 
which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, turn from the wicked ways. I'll hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin. I'll heal their land. I want to tell you one story in conclusion. I remember years ago, my little daughter had a young girl stayed all night with her, and I was preaching. And that little girl didn't go to church. And I was preaching. And I said, in conclusion, and that little girl said to my daughter, what does it mean when your daddy says, in conclusion? And Savannah said, absolutely nothing. <laughs> but I promise you, but I promise you, in conclusion, I promise. David Livingston was the first missionary to take the gospel to Africa. He went to Assam, Africa. He wanted to take the gospel to a place where headhunters were. And David Livingston was in Assam, Africa, taking the gospel there. And one night word came to him that these savages were going to invade their camp and kill David Livingston and his few men. David Livingston said, we simply prayed. But he said the next morning the sun arose and the headhunters didn't do anything. And he said one year later, one year later, true story documented, one year later, I saw the chief of those headhunters. And that chief and those men with him had became believers. They had became believers in Christ. And he said to him, why didn't you kill us that night? We got word that you were going to kill us. Why didn't you do it? Oh, he said, we plan to do it. He said, we came to do it. But when we came to do it, your camp was surrounded by 47 men who had a sword in one hand and a lot in the other hand. And he said, we knew we were no match for those 47 warriors with a sword in one hand and a lot in the other hand. He said, so we retreated. David Livingston said three years later, three years later, I was in Scotland and I told that story. And he said, a man came up to me and he said, I want to ask you. He said, here's my prayer journal. He said, did that happen January the 14th, 1856? David Livingston said that was the date. And that man said, let me explain. A group of men met here that night to study the Bible. And God placed on my heart that we didn't need to study the Bible that night. We simply needed to pray for the safety of David Livingston. And we spent the night praying for your safety. And he said, I just want you to know, David Livingston, there was 47 men there that night. Ladies and gentlemen, if we will abide, if we will ask, I promise you, God will answer. Let's pray. Lord, as I bow my head and my heart in your presence, I thank you for Bert Jones. I am so proud of Bert, God. I thank you for his heart for people because I know he truly loves people and he loves you. And God, I pray for every member of this delegation. These are wonderful men and women. And I pray that you will give them your grace, your protection, your wisdom. God, your hand of favor on their lives. I ask you to bless them indeed, enlarge their coast, keep your good hand up on them, and keep them from evil. For I pray this prayer in the name above every name. That's the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus, the Lamb of glory. To you come we pray. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would indulge on me for one second, just one second, and then you can stick a fork in me, I'll be done. It's been my honor and privilege to be here. 
I wanted to bring something to Bert, for Bert today. I wanted to present something to him. His position in this body is the president. He's the president of the Senate. Our first president. Does anybody remember what our first president, I don't know if you're aware of this, but I want to just make you aware of something. Our first president didn't belong to a political party. And the reason why he didn't belong to a political party, he said the time will come if we're not careful, we'll put parties before people. That's what our first president, George Washington, said, by the way. George Washington also said, we can't govern without God and the Bible. So I thought of no greater gift. I was with my friend Jensen Franklin, and I said, Jensen, I want to get one of your legacy study Bibles because I want to present it to Lieutenant Governor Burt Jones because Burt can't govern without God and the Bible. Burt, I am proud of you. You know I'm proud of you. Thank you. Thank you.
The Senate will come back to order, please. Ready to go, aren't we? The Senate will come back to order, please. If everyone would return to their chairs, please. I'm going to share with you that um, our newly installed president of the Senate has been called away on some official business, but he asked for me to relate to this body uh, and ask for a moment of silence, very sadly and tragically, because of the storms that passed through in his home area last night, a five-year-old boy in Butts County lost his life. And I would ask that uh, in honor of the boy and his family and the request of our Lieutenant Governor that we have a moment of silence, please. Amen and thank you. All right, we'll get on with the business of uh, our chamber this morning and I would ask, are there any unanimous consents? Hearing none, does any senator wish to rise on a point of personal privilege? Okay. Senator recognizes the senator from the 32nd. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm here to um, introduce the doctor of the day. Some of you know that I am married to an emergency physician and he's not the doctor of the day, but the guy who is, is also an emergency physician. His name is Dr. Brett Cannon. And so if you are feeling poorly or have medical questions, he waits down there to take care of you. Dr. Cannon earned his undergraduate and medical degrees from the University of North Carolina and he then trained at Emory University where he served as chief, chief resident and got an MBA from the University of Georgia. He joined Apollo MD in 2000 and has served as medical director for multiple facilities. And he, so he has dual expertise in medicine but also in business. He has won many awards and currently he's serving as president overseeing clinical operations within the Wellstar Health System in Atlanta. So please go visit Dr. Brett Cannon. Mr. President, I yield the well. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. The Senator has yielded the well. And if I could add a comment from the chair, and that is, please take your, a moment when these doctors of the day are here, even if you don't need to see them for medical reasons, just go by and thank them for being here. Those of us that have been here a little time can think of instances where the doctor being in the house and close by made a difference uh, in someone's life, quite frankly. So telling them we appreciate them volunteering a day of their service would be most appropriate. The chair recognizes the senator from the 40th for a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President. Following the 2022 legislative session, the senator from the 56th and I co-chaired a study committee on people living with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We heard so many stories from people all around the state about the enormous difficulties they experienced trying to meet the needs of their loved ones. We also heard from service providers these are small businesses who can't retain enough staff because wage reimbursements are too low. But this morning, I rise with a very heavy heart to tell you about a horrible yet preventable tragedy that occurred this week. In Forsyth County, Jerry Fricks and his 26-year-old daughter Megan perished in what police believe was a murder-suicide. Megan had autism. Her mother passed away three years ago, which left her father as her sole caregiver. Though the family did receive some home assistance, the support was simply not enough. Extreme situations can cause people 
to do things they would not typically do. And as a state, we bear the responsibility for failing this family. The story of Jerry and Megan Fricks is heart-wrenching, but it's not surprising. They are not alone. My constituents who have faced similar circumstances have told me that suicidal thoughts are not uncommon. The burdens some caregivers must carry can be overwhelming and exhausting. At the Biennial Institute, we learned that the number one reason Georgians are not working is because they are caring for a sick or disabled family member. You have on your desk a chart that gives you what those numbers are. Now, when his wife passed away, Jerry Fricks, he had, ha he had to quit his job to care for his daughter, Megan, which meant he had very little income to support her very costly needs. As we tackle work workforce issues together this session, I want you to keep Jerry and Megan Fricks in mind. Caregiving issues are workforce issues. Underpaid service providers are workforce issues. We must do more for people like Jerry and Megan Fricks. It's time to make a plan for moving the 7,000 people off the waiting list for home and community-based services. And it's time to pay caregivers, direct service professionals, competitive wages they can live on so they won't leave the field. We need to do this not just because it's the right thing to do for these families, but it's the right thing to do for Georgia. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the well. Thank you, Senator. The Senator has yielded the well. The Chair recognizes the Senator from the 48th. Senator from the 48th. 48th, maybe he waves. Chair recognizes the Senator from the 39th. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, we have been in and out of this chamber so much this week um, that we may have missed that on Monday it was National Law Enforcement Appreciation Day. Uh -oh. um, and in a moment, I'm going to ask that we show our appreciation for our law enforcement with a standing round of applause. But before that, I want to tell you a story. Last Saturday night, I had the opportunity and real honor of joining our Georgia State Patrol officers on one of their shifts from 7 p.m. to 2 a.m. And I think I surprised them when I stayed the entire time. But I want to tell you that I got to ride on the ground and in the air as well with aviation patrol in the helicopter. I've always known that it takes courage, bravery, selfless service, and much more to do the job that they do each day. But what I learned that night is that our Georgia State Patrol along with the other departmental members of the Crime Suppression Unit, represent world-class professionalism, efficiency, collaboration and coordination, and effectiveness. They took great care of me, and I learned so much from them that night. Our law enforcement officials are the ones who keep us safe every single day. From our homes to the Capitol, we owe them the gratitude and the appreciation of our offices and their work is truly commendable. For those of us who are legislators especially, we must remember that we are writing the laws that we require our law enforcement officers to enforce. And there's no doubt that even this session, we will see issues pertaining to crime, law enforcement, our officers even, that may come up this session. And it can only prove helpful to have insight and perspective into what these officers go through as we debate potential legislation. No matter what side of the aisle you're on, Democrat or Republican, we should all agree that law enforcement is impacted by the work that we do right here. 
If our communities need a better relationship with our law enforcement, then as leaders, it is also incumbent on us to develop a strong relationship with our law enforcement as well. So, to that end, I am establishing a club, and I'm calling it the Arms Around Safety Club, and I am inviting each of you to join me and your other colleagues to join the club. The only requirement is that you complete a ride-along with our Georgia State Patrol while we're in session. There are already many of us who've already agreed, I think I'm up to seven, and we cut across party lines, uh, leadership or not, Republican or not, but we've already got many people in this chamber who've already agreed to do a ride. So like many of us in this room, I am pro-law enforcement, I'm also pro-police accountability, and pro-criminal justice reform. We often talk about these things as though they can't coexist, but they are not mutually exclusive, and they can and should happen simultaneously. So I'm not really only asking, I'm really imploring each of us to take the opportunity to do a ride along. I know we won't get to 100%. There are issues of mobility or safety. Trust me, I walked out of my house that night at five foot three, 130 pounds, and my family too was concerned, um, but it was a great experience and one that I will do again. I will go with any of you if you would like for me to, and when I get off this dais, if you want to hear more about my experience, I'm happy to share it with you. So, uh, uh -oh. so let me thank and express my personal gratitude to Commissioner Chris Wright, Major Kendrick Lowe, and Corporal Anthony Munoz. And I wanna ask that all of us please give the law enforcement officers and the different law enforcement agencies that protect us every day a round of applause now for the sacrifices that they make and for protecting our communities and for us every single day. Thank you. I yield the well. Thank you, Senator. The Senator has yielded the well. The Chair recognizes the Senator from the 36th for a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, colleagues, it's good to be back uh, together uh, with our uh, newly minted uh, senator colleagues that are joining us from around the state. Uh, wish want to wish you a, a great new year and, uh, and I'm optimistic about what we can do working together uh, in the best interest of Georgians. Uh, on, on a similar note to uh, my colleague from the 39th, I, I wanted to flag for you and announce uh, a uh, piece of federal funding uh, in support of law enforcement uh, that we've uh, secured. Uh, Senator, U.S. Senator John Ossoff uh, brought to one of my cities that I represent, College Park, right down by the airport, uh, a uh, ballistics database that's going to be uh, an invaluable asset to addressing uh, crimes committed with guns. It's a, it's a ballistic, ballistics uh, database and a uh, little bit shy, of, between $350,000 and $400,000 was secured to bring that to College Park and it will be shared and available to the uh, adjacent cities uh, in, in our county and nearby counties. And that is to tr speed up terrifically um, the ability to do ballistics tracking when you when you uh, find spent cartridges at the scene of a crime, uh, it can it's a real overload over at uh, our state facility to to submit and wait for those ballistics uh, readings to and that's a direct pathway to to. Uh, it, it, law enforcement to be able to find a perpetrator that has uh, uh, used a gun 
in, in the criminal activity. So I wanted to thank Senator Ossoff, make you aware of that uh, capability that you may want to may want to seek for places that you represent around the state. But it's 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 one more weapon, if you will, uh, in the fight against violent. Uh, crime where guns are used. And I know the mayor, the city council, the leadership in College Park and surrounding uh, towns and cities uh, welcome this opportunity because it will not be solely for that uh, jurisdiction, but it will be utilized and shared and accessible uh, uh, regionally. Uh, so thanks again to Senator Ossoff and uh, I salute the leadership in College Park who has embraced this and is moving forward with uh, law enforcement. Thank you, and I yield the well. The senator has yielded the well. Um, I now call under Senator from the 19th. Thank you, Mr. President. Members of the Senate, just a reminder, next week is budget week. As you know, we'll start Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. with the governor presenting his budget, rolling through various agencies. There's a little change up on the agenda this year that will lay out some of the items that you have brought as items you thought were specific and wanted us to dive a little bit deeper into so it won't be the same just commissioner reports that you may have seen in the past. In preparation for that, if you're on the Appropriations Committee, you know you're invited. Actually, all senators are invited uh, to sit through any of those hearings. They'll also be streamed online, although you won't be able to ask your questions online. It's not your online part's not interactive. Your budget book, if you want to pick up the hard copy budget book, it's over at the Senate Budget Office building for you new members across the hall, right through the security stand and immediately to the right uh, in the CLOB. Uh, it, the one book, you, your staff, or your intern can sign it out, and they do have to sign their names because, uh, budget joke here, we actually pay for those books, and we have to make sure that uh, every senator has one. There, it'll also be available online uh, on the OPB website. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the will. Thank you, Senator, and thank you for the outstanding job you're doing as our appropriations chair and look forward to being with you next week. And uh, uh, we are grateful to have a uh, senator from the 19th uh, chair in that committee. So we appreciate that, Senator. I now call on the senator from the 51st. Thank you, Mr. President. Senators, uh, as you all are aware of the storms that came through Georgia yesterday, uh, devastated part of our communities. It also took an employee of ours, uh, uh, tragically during the night, one of the DOT employees, his name is Sean Kornacki. He was killed in the line of duty in the early mornings. This morning is clearing the roadways up in Walker County. He was the uh, highway maintenance foreman for District 6. And uh, he worked for the DOT for the past 16 years. So I'd like to ask the president to uh, uh, allow us to t take a moment of silence and remember his family in your prayers. Please give the center a moment of silence. Amen. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate that. And, and unfortunately, um, you know, I had uh, in, in my home county of Butts and neighboring county of Spalding, we had significant damages there and, um, and uh, had, a, had the fatality of a young, a young little boy of five years old. So please keep, you, keep your thoughts and prayers uh, with those family members and, and um, definitely keep our thoughts and prayers of the member of the person you're referring to, to uh, Mr. Majority Leader. So uh, tragic times, but um, thank you for that, Senator. You have a um, consent calendar of privileges, resolutions before you. Does any senator wish to remove a resolution from the consent calendar? Chair hearing none. Is there objection to the adoption of the resolutions on the consent calendar? Chair hears none, and the resolution of the consent calendar are adopted. The chair recognizes the majority leader for a motion. Thank you, Mr. President. In the words of Thomas Carlisle, the time has come for all of us to go home and perform the duties that lie near us. Therefore, I make a motion. 
pursuant to Senate Resolution 6, that the Senate stand adjourned until 10 a.m. on Monday, January 23rd, 2023. The Majority Leader has moved for the adjournment, channeling the Sir Thomas Carlyle's messaging of sic vos non vobis, I believe. Isn't that, isn't that correct, Senator? <clears throat> Are there any additional announcements? The Secretary, read the, read the caption? No? Okay. The Majority Leader has moved the Senate stand adjourned until Monday, January 23rd uh, at 10 a.m. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, no. No. Ayes clearly have it. We are adjourned. <laughs>